My wife would become very unhappy if I left it somewhere. Okay. All right, we've just made, we've just made nine has two factors pass. What happens if we do 10? But can we get another failing test? Does anybody think we can get another failing test? No, I think the algorithm's done. Okay, now if I didn't think it was done, I would write more tests until I was comfortable with. And this one's kind of tricky, so I might jump ahead and do 100. I might do some more, just to make myself feel a little better. Okay, but I, I'm pretty confident that there's the algorithm. Can we do anything to that algorithm? Okay, there's the algorithm, and there's duplication in here. This is the second half of the course, is learning how to spot duplication. So what's our problem? That's a performance enhancement. We could do that if, we're, if performance is our problem. N greater than 1. N greater than 1. What happens to that? This is where we have to think, guys. N will always be. No. Oh, you can put that n greater than 1 in the second mile. And n is greater than 1. And you got Just move it to the second. Actually, you raise that line. Yeah, why? Or it's never going to be greater than 1. It can never be greater than 1. All right? It can never be. So if I leave this code in, it just makes that algorithm harder to read. This is the kind of stuff that you want to get rid of. This is the part that people, you know, you're saying, okay, but it's done, dead simple. This is the part where you think. This is where your brain has to work. So we're going to get rid of that line. And go away line. And if I run the tests, All right, so make that change quickly. Get rid of that line, and then we're done. We have just done Bob Martin's kata, prime factors kata. Uh, I was at Agile 2004, I think it was, and I was sitting next to Ken Hour and Richard Gabriel. Who knows Richard Gabriel? And not the singer. <laughs> Nobody? Oh, Peter Gabriel. Richard Gabriel. Richard Gabriel was one of the open source guys. Anyway, he became a poet. He taught at Stanford for years. He suddenly decided to become a poet after being a programmer for years. So he went to school to become a poet and then came and taught us. And one of the stories he told us was to become a poet, I had to write the same poem a thousand times. He wrote that same poem. It was a little poem. That was the poem that got him his PhD in in poetry, and he had to write it a thousand times, over and over and over and over again. So he said, everybody in the room who has programmed something twice, the same thing twice, raise their hand. Let's do that. Okay. I was sitting next to Ken Hour, and I got my hand up. I'm proud. He says, everybody who's, keep your hands up. Just keep your hands up for a second. Everybody who's programmed the same thing three times. Ooh, that looks good. Four times. <laughs> Five times. Wow, six times, seven times, eight times, nine times, and my hand went down about then, ten times. Does what? <laughs> yeah, I actually, just, just so I could get that back up, I redid Hello World like four or five more times. <laughs> but I was sitting next to Ken Allen about ten. Uh, everybody else's arm was down in the room, including mine. And Ken Hours was still up. And about 17 Ken Hours came, hand came down. And I went home on the airplane. I wrote Hello World a bunch more times. <laughs> Just go so I could leave it up longer. 
the point is, we need to practice what we do. And if we practice on great big huge hard problems, if we rewrite the same thing, we need to practice on little things. And Bob Martin has put one of these together. It's on the web. Just look up Uncle Bob, Uncle Bob prime factors, all right? And run through this one. He's got another one, the bowling, the bowling game. Highly recommend it. It's fun, and it's got a little bit more. It's a little harder than this one. All right, that's homework. All right, so what happened to my computer? I can't the point. That's all right. I think, yeah, you have to, it's not, your pointing device has to be a direct a line of sight. All right, I want to skip, I'm going to skip the exercise. What we're doing, skip this particular exercise. We'll come back to it, I hope. What I want to do is, I can't see that far. <laughs> OK, so the question I get all the time is, Jean, I can't do this. And I say, why can't you do this? So somebody tell me what we can't test. Just name something. We can't test this. Just say it. We can't test nuclear weapon detonation. OK, that's a good one. What would you say? OK, OK, but I, yeah, but you don't get to talk. <laughs> All right. Nobody thinks there's, not, there's something we can't test? Real-time systems. OK, so, so the people say, Jean, I can't test it. It's legacy code. It looks like that. It's not possible. And that's good legacy code. Yeah, so that's what I want to hear, those things. Yeah. The, one, the one I really hear, the people that really grumble are they say, well, legacy code is one of them because it's too ugly. The next one they say is I can't test GUIs. I can't test nuclear, <laughs> nuclear launch launching. Okay, it turns out we can. You're going to be up in a second. It turns out we can, and Richard is about to show us how. The thing is that what's important to be able to test legacy systems, because I don't know, who gets to work on clean code or, or beginning code it's from scratch? When's the last project you did? Greenfield, thank you. Greenfield, all right, are you working on it now? Were you working on it last year, Greenfield? Yeah, see that? All the hands go down. So we don't get to work on Greenfield very often. When we do, we're like, yes, yes. But it, guess how long it takes to turn Greenfield untested greenfield code into legacy code. So Richard is a little short, one month. Jim Shore says three months, OK? And I'd rather side with Richard on this one. But Jim Shore says three months. So if you've been on your greenfield development and haven't been writing tests for three months, you've got legacy code. OK, that's, that's just the way it is, OK? That's, that's, the fact, legacy code defined by James Grinning is any code that's untested. And by the time three months goes by, there's going to be enough bricks and, and rocks falling down in little odd places that you probably, you probably have wanted your testing. And if you go longer than that, it's going to cost you a lot to get those tests in. All right, so what do we do to help our legacy code out? The, one of my favorite things is don't be afraid to, you, know, you want to get inside. Just get inside. Go inside. Take small steps. Okay? And there is a light. Luckily, <laughs> in the middle of this pyramid, there is a light at the end of that. Um, the other thing we want to do is make sure we get lots of shoring. Now, make sure we get scaffolding up. Okay? Lots of it. All right? That's what we do, how we deal with legacy code. All right. Richard has got... Can you guys see that? Good? OK, so what we're looking at here is just a really dumb little application that is an address book. I can add an address. And this is existing code, legacy code. This, what we're going to do is we're going to write a test for the behavior that's on this add address dialog. You notice that this OK button is disabled until I type some text in the first name field. 
that's the behavior that we're going to unit test. We're going to write a test that says the OK button should be disabled when the field is empty, and it should be enabled when the field has some text in it. Because that's the existing behavior that I have on this dialog, I want to write a test to cover the existing behavior, because then we're going to add some new behavior, and I want to make sure the new behavior I add does not break the old behavior. So that's the application. It's really quite stupid. Let's go over here and take a look at the existing code on the form. And you see in here there's a handler for the text changed event on that first name text box. And he just says, yeah, got to have non-empty text for that OK button to be enabled. Whenever the text is changed, I'm going to keep setting that. So what we're going to do is we're going to move this behavior to another class. And the reason we want to do that is because this class is a form, and it has controls on it, and they all get created whenever this form gets created by initialized component. And creating the controls involves looking up all these resources and setting all these attributes on the individual controls. That means instantiating this class is expensive. And we want our unit tests to run fast, because we're going to end up with hundreds and thousands of thousands and thousands of unit tests after we work on this thing for five years, right? We're going to have all kinds of unit tests. We want them to run fast so that every time we make a change, it's quick to get an answer to that question of, did I break something? So we're going to make a new class. And what I'm going to follow is something called the mediator pattern. A mediator class is just a class that coordinates the interaction of other objects. So I'm going to add a class called Add address form mediator. OK, got that class. That's fine. I'm going to add a test project to my solution. Oops. So add new project. It's going to be a C sharp class library, and I'm going to call it test add. Address, test address book. So all I'm doing so far is just getting like my test, this, this is legacy code. It doesn't have any tests on it, right? So I'm just getting my test framework set up. That makes a, uh, so I made a project to hold my tests. You always want to keep your test code separate from your production code so that your production code doesn't ever accidentally become dependent on your tests, because you're not going to ship your tests. You're going to ship your production code only. So on my test project here, I'm going to add a reference to the NUnit framework so I can use it to write my tests. And the first time add reference runs always takes a while, as in any of these C-sharp guys, I'm sure you know. You can't see it, but my hard drive light's on solid. Here we go. End unit framework. OK, I don't need this data and XML and link stuff. We're not going to be doing any of that. I'm going to call this class test add address form mediator. You can name your class, your test classes, and your test files anything you want. I like to make it obvious what I'm trying to test just from the name. So this thing is going to be a test fixture, because it's going to be a class that holds tests. These little pop-up boxes you're seeing are coming from ReSharper, which is helping me fill in stuff. And the first test I like to write for a new class, I like to call it construct. And it basically is my one-stop shop for finding out how to make an instance of this class. So I'm going to say add address form mediator. And what I need to do, oops, this class needs to be public so I can see it from my test. And I need to reference, added my, I needed to add a reference to my production code. So I added, a, made my test code refer to my production code. 
and imported its namespace. And I'm just going to say assert that is not null mediator. And this little message I'm writing is just for me. Now, you notice I didn't say new class name. I said dot get instance. The reason I do that is I like to uh, do what's called encapsulating construction on the classes that I write. So we hide the constructor. And you might say, why do you, why do you bother to do that? Well, I do that so that if, suppose at some later date, uh, this guy needs to be a singleton and everybody needs to use the same exact instance. Or suppose I need to do some kind of special thing every time one of these objects is created, but the callers that are getting these instances don't need to know about that. So by decoupling myself from the direct use of the constructor, I'm able to localize any of those decisions right here inside this. Uh, something I encounter often is sometimes you need to do what you call two-phase initialization, where there's certain things that don't work right if you do it, try to do it from the constructor, but it will work if you do it on any other method. So I'll do the constructor and then do the, the second phase initialization inside here. So again, I encapsulate that inside this method. All the guys that are using this class don't need to know about that. So let's go back to look at our test. I've got a test here that says how to make an instance. I can build this code. Build succeeded and go over here to end unit. I'll load up my test framework, my test assembly. So that's in test, bin, debug. Here's my test assembly. Loads that up. I've got one test here. I run that test. My test is green. Now I kind of cheated because I went off and I implemented the I implemented this get instance right as I was writing it because I knew I, I'm kind of doing that I know exactly what I want so I'm kind of a, skipping a step I didn't quite strictly speaking have a red test so now I've got this mediator what I want to do is I want to start moving this behavior from this form off onto the mediator so I know I know that the form's going to need a mediator because that's where all the work is going to happen. And this is the behavior that I want to move. So instead of doing that, I'm going to say mediator first name text changed. Now, this is the thing that I want to have, you know, implement the behavior on, you know, that's going to interact with my form. So I'm going to go ahead and stub that out. And I'm going to say not implemented exception because what I want to do, let me keep that around. What I want to do is write a test that says what that first name change should do. So the test is, OK enabled when first name not empty. So I say mediator dot. Uh, I have to make a mediator. Mediator dot first name text change. That's the production code that I want to call. And now I need to assert something here. I need to say, uh, you know, it is true that on a on the form that the OK uh, enabled property was set. And I want to say that not only was it set. but the last value it was set to was true. Now I don't have a form yet, so how am I gonna, how am I gonna do that? Let's have the mediator talk to the form through an interface. So I'm just gonna make an interface 
I don't know how I'm going to get one yet. I don't even know what this interface is, but I know it's going to be something that our real form will have to implement. So I know this um, I'm kind of getting a little let's let's do this. I'm going to the mediator is going to have to talk to the form. So let's get that adjusted here. I don't want this to be internal. So we know that this mediator is going to have to collaborate with the form, which is where all the controls live, because he is going to orchestrate the interaction between the controls. So what we're going to do is have an interface that handles all those interactions for the mediator. Now, in my test, I've got, I'm, I've got it written here that you know I've got this interface, and then I've got some things down here that I want to know for my test. But these are not things that I want to expose in my production code. So really what I want in my test is I want some kind of stand-in for the real form. Because remember, the whole reason we're moving this to another class in the first place is I don't want to instantiate that real form because it's a heavyweight. So I'm going to make a fake form. And now for this fake form, it's going to have to be a class it's going to have to implement the interface that the production form uses, which we don't know what that interface is yet. We're going to do this encapsulation stuff on it, just like we did before. And these are the things we want to know about how the mediator interacted with the form. So we know that these have to be properties on our fake. They're Things that are fake is going to tell us. We don't know what they're going to. We don't know what they're going to do yet. But these are the things that we want to know in our test. Okay, so at this point. Sharper is telling me, hey, you didn't give me a form up here. OK, fine. I'll, I'll do the simplest thing to get that test to compile. And over here, I'm going to do the simplest thing just to get him to compile. Oops. OK, so our build succeeded. We've got a failing test. OK? We've got a failing test because our stand-in form doesn't really do anything except throw not implemented exceptions yet. So let's see if we can do a little something on here. We know that um, what we really wanted to have happen over here, if we go back and look at our production code that we're trying to get covered by tests, this was the old. This was the old behavior right here, is that he was setting the enabled property of the OK button, and he was reading the text property of the first name text box control. So those are good candidates for what we need to have on this interface for our fake and our production form. So let's go over here to our mediator. Let's take this interface, and we're going to say, Public bool, OK enabled, and he's going to have a setter, because that's all we need. Um, oh, it's an interface. It's always public. And he's going to access the first name text at, with a getter. So, I th so based on our existing production code, these are the kinds of interactions that the mediator needs to have with the form. So let's take this. 
I'll just move that off to its own file. Okay, so we have the form interface, we have the mediator, and we know that the production form has to implement that interface. And we know that this mediator needs to talk back to the real form. So when we construct the mediator, we're going to use the production implementation of this interface. I'll stub out the implementation of the interface. Right now, I'm just going to leave these with not implemented, and we'll come back to them in a minute because we're, we're focusing on the mediator first, but I want this, all this code to compile. So I'm going to come back over here to the mediator, and this was the production code that we had. And then his first name, text changed. We're just going to steal that implementation by pasting it in and then saying, well, instead of accessing the enabled property on that control directly, now I'm accessing that same thing through the form. And ditto for the first name text. So now I've moved that production code from the dialog where it was sitting directly in the event handler. I've moved it over here to the mediator. The mediator is interacting with those controls through an interface. And the reason we want to do that extra level of indirection is so that when we write our tests, we can write a fake that stands in for the real form. And he's going to say, oh yeah, my first name text is empty, and my OK button has not been set yet. And he's going he's to record the interaction of the mediator with the controls in the test scenario. So if we come back here and look at our test, we should now have, we have our fake form. He doesn't yet, uh, oh, he's not implementing the members of the interface yet. So now we'll put the implementation on the fake. What does the fake want to do? The fake wants to do two things. He wants to remember all the things that were done to him so that you can, in your test, you can write assertions and say, when I talked to the, when I told the mediator to do something, did he interact with the fake form in the right way? Did he do the things to the fake form that he was supposed to do? And did the, so that's the one thing. You want to remember what you do to the fake form. So in this case, we want to remember that we called the setter on the OK enabled property. And we want to remember the last value that was set on it. So I'm going to make some backing store for these. And then my accessors that I had written, had stubbed out, are going to now return those values. OK. We also want to remember the same thing for the first name text. Except in this case, it's a getter. So a getter on a fake has to return what I like to call a lie. Your fake objects are going to lie to your production code to force the production code down the code path that you want to test. So I have to return something here. I'm just going to return to make my first test pass. I'm just going to return a, a string, a fixed string. And I'm going to put a getter on that property. Just rename it to follow .NET naming conventions. So up here, we learned that uh, based on this, remember, we're writing a covering test here. We're not writing a test for new functionality. We're writing a test to try to cover the behavior of existing functionality. And so it's OK to cheat when writing the test and look at this and say, this is the production behavior I want to call or I want to cover. There's two things that happened here. It did a set property on one part of the form, and it did a get property on the other part of the form. So I want to make sure that those things are validated in my test. Because we, so we, 
did a assertion on the part that did the right. Now let's do an assertion on the part that did the read. So we asserted that we did the read. What we have configured this fake form to do is that whenever it's asked for the first name, it's always going to return this fixed string. So now we should have a passing test that covers one test case, one test scenario for this existing production code. There's um, Another, the other test case that's in here, can anybody tell me what that is? See if you're asleep. Come on, it's easy. There's only two things that can happen, right? The button is either enabled or disabled. So what's the other test case is when, oops, you're going to say, OK, disabled when first name empty. So we can, it's very similar to this case, so we can start out with this. So let's see, we know that the OK enabled set should have happened just like before, except this time the last value should have been false instead of true. And we know that we should have gotten the value of the first name text. So let's go ahead and compile this. The build succeeded. We'll go ahead and run the tests. OK, that one fails. Now, it fails because on my fake form, it always returns Richard whenever I ask for the first name. So what I need to do is enhance my fake a little bit so that I can say, don't just return the same thing every time, but I want you to, on this test, so this is the OK enabled when the first name not empty. So I want to say form your first name text fake result. I'll be consistent here and say get fake result is Richard. OK, I don't have that on my fake yet. So we'll go off and put that over there. And the setter is going to say, First name text get fake result is value. Go ahead and make backing store for that. And come back down here. Instead of returning this fixed string, we will return first name text get fake result. Now I've added that configuration here. Does anybody think this second test that I've written is going to pass now? He says, my code's not going to compile. But I don't need a getter on that. <laughs> OK. Now do you think my test is going to pass? He says yes. He says no. My test does not pass because that backing field was not initialized. And I'm take, trying to access the length property of an empty, or of not an empty string, but of a null value. So we'll go back over here to our test, and we say, yeah, you know, now I'm being really explicit about the state of this form before I try to exercise production code that interacts with the form. Now I'm saying, you know, in this case, I said, hey, the name has to be empty for this test. Well, that's what I said right here. As I said, the first name text get fake result is an empty string. So now, when I compile this, go back over here, now rerun my tests. And what did I do wrong? Ah, I did not change my assertion because I copy pasted. The, what did I do here? Um, it should have been set to call. You have it set to OK enable set call. Yeah, yeah. You mean in the implementation of this? Yeah, yeah. You're right. right yeah. Look, see, I found a bug in my face. 
Sometimes automatic completion is a blessing and sometimes it's a curse. Okay, now our tests are green. So we've covered the two, sim admittedly simplistic, but we've covered all the two different possible behaviors of that dialogue. So are there any questions on this before we go and add some new behavior to this dialogue by putting, wiring it up through the mediator? Okay. Earlier versions of this presentation, I had a lot more behavior on the dialogue and we just found it was just too much work to get through in the, in the time available. So let's say, let's go back and look at our design view of this address form here. And we're saying, hey, you know, it's, it's nice that this OK button is disabled when the required first name text is missing, but it's an extremely subtle hint to the user. So what we'd really like to do also is we'd like to enhance this dialog so that the fields that require input are labeled with red text and not just ordinary text. So that's what we're going to go and try and implement test-driven style. So we've covered all the existing behavior of this production dialog with our existing tests. And we're going to add some new behavior here. Um, does anybody see some duplication here that we might be able to get rid of between these two tests? OK, so looks like we do this thing, and we do this thing every time in both these tests. So while we're green, we can take advantage of this time and we also do it up here, although we pass in a null for this, for the form. Uh, so we've got some duplication between all three of these tests. We can, while we're green, we can refactor that out into a, a setup method. Where what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, yeah, split that declaration so I can take the declaration and put it up here and make it a member. And let's do the same for this one. And take that out, put it up here, and make it a member. And then we we'll know we're going to need one of these forms. Let's move that into the common setup. We know we're going to need one of these mediators. Put that in the common setup. The mediator is taking a form. So I've, I've moved that out of one of my tests. I'm just leaving the other tests alone for now. My build succeeded. Run my tests again. We're all still green, so that's good. I didn't break any of my tests by this change. Now what I can do is I can say I don't need to create this mediator here because it's going to make one in the common test setup. And from my third test case, I can say, yeah, I don't need to make a form, and I don't need to make a mediator. Those are happening in my common test setup. My build succeeded. Go back here, run my tests again. My tests are all green. Now, if I was using a source code control system, that would be a great time to commit changes and lock in positive gains, right? So now we eliminated some duplication by just doing a little refactoring phase on our test code. Let's go write the test for our new situation. We want to say, now when I first make, when I first construct this form, the first name field is empty. So as soon as I make the mediator, which is created at the same time as the form is created, he should immediately say, what's the first name text? Oh, it's empty. Your label should be red. So I was thinking I might need a new test case, but it turns out because it happens as soon as the mediator is constructed because it's tied to the lifetime of the form, I could just add more assertions that say, when you construct one of these, this is something that should happen every time it's constructed because its lifetime and the form's lifetime are intimately tied together. So I can say on here, um, it is true that on my fake form, you should have set the color of the first name label. It's also true that 
the color it's set it to should have been red. I'm going to need to add system.drawing so I can talk about colors. The first name label color set last value. Okay, I don't, my fake doesn't know anything about these yet. Let's go ahead and stub those out on my fake. I know what it's going to look like. Now some people say, hey, it's just a fake object. I don't need to do that encapsulation behind a property. I'll just make the field directly on the fake. Uh, we could do, we'll just do one that way. It's a system dot drawing color. So in that case, I just made it a public field on my fake. Uh, I like to do the encapsulation with ReSharper. It's not significantly longer, but you can do it either way. So hey, that's fine. Uh, that's what our test says, right? Should, these things should have happened. Code built OK. Let's see what happens now. Well, now our construct test is failing because we haven't done anything on the production side to make this actually happen yet. Now, what I've done is I've said, yeah, I need to know these things about my fake form, but I haven't defined anything yet on the interface for the form that the mediator is going to use. And then when we try to go and make this pass by adding an implementation over here, that's when we're going to find out uh, yeah, um, hey, on the form, the, if the first name text length is greater than zero, then I don't need to do anything. If it's equal to zero, I want to say form dot first name label color is color dot red. And I want to use system drawing dot color. Now he's saying, yeah, but I'm only talking to the form through the interface. The interface doesn't have anything that lets me set the color yet. So I'll go ahead and put that over on the interface. Because I've changed the interface, the fake form and the production form now need to be updated to implement the new member. So if I go over here to the fake form first, I'd say implement the member. Yeah, we. Strictly speaking, we can go back here. We don't need a get on this. We can just do a set. So then he says, ah, you're trying to set my color. Let me remember that. Last value, remember that too. OK, so that's my fake. And remember, we have two objects implementing the same interface, and we just added a new member on the interface, so we have to go back to all the objects that implement that interface. And on the form, we have to implement that. Now, over here, we haven't really implemented anything yet. I'm just going to leave that as not implemented exception for right now, because we just want to test the behavior on our mediator first. OK, now everything's red. So what happened? What happened was that on our fake form, at least I think this is what happened. Let's take a look at our test. Our test said we should have set the first name label color, and that it should have been set to red. So look at the mediator. He says, we should have gotten the first name text, and that we should have uh, set the label color if the text length was empty. So down here, We have object not set to an instance. OK, since I managed to confuse myself, let's just go back here. 
Ah, but it happened on all three tests, so it must be this part that's causing the problem. That's the last change we made. Go back over here, run our tests again. Our construct test is still red. So my form must be null, or my first name text must be null on my form, which it is on my fake. So we change the behavior. Oops, let's go back over here, look at our test. We change the behavior of what happens when we construct a mediator. But right here, the mediator gets constructed, the form was created, but the fake form didn't have his first name text fake result set up to anything. So what happened was that was null, and then the constructor immediately tried to access that. That caused our test to fail. So now we'll go back here and look at this. Okay, now our test is passing. Okay, now we've made, we've put the behavior over on the mediator. We've made new behavior on the mediator, but the last thing that we were missing was this production implementation of our interface. Now, due to the way that we put things on the interface, we said, oh, it's the OK enabled property. So I'm pretty sure that means OK button dot enabled. That's the production implementation of the interface over here on this getter. That's the implementation of that. And this is first, uh, I have to go briefly over here to my designer and implement or generate a member for this label so we can talk to it through code. So I had generate member set to false. We'll change that to true. So now I can say first name label dot four color is value. Okay, now we don't have tests directly covering this class, this production code, right? We put all the behavior on another class and that's what we're unit testing. So making sure that you've got this stuff wired up properly still requires manual testing. But when we look at the code, we just look at that and we say, yeah, that's just correct by inspection. There's no branching, there's no looping, there's no checking, there's no nothing. It's just, yeah, take that thing and shove it on there. Or take this thing from here and give it back. So when we look at this implementation of the production interface, we say, yeah, I can look at that and, and I don't feel that that's where the bug is as long as there's no not implemented crap, right? As long as we implemented the whole interface, because these properties were really simple, they're just Boolean and string. I just look at that and I think, yeah, that, that's good. So now I have my unit tests on my, that covered my new behavior that I wanted to add. Now let's just go and make sure that it's really on the form. Okay, so here's our main window. And when I click add over here, the label's red. It's red because I didn't type anything. Now it's red when it's, it's set to red in the constructor. We covered one case but we still have more behavior that we would want to cover because we want to say, yeah, it shouldn't be red anymore as soon as I satisfy the constraint, right? So if we have time, I can go write a test to that. Do we have time? Well, it should take a few minutes. Let's try it. Let's see how long it's going to take us to do that. So back over here, go back down to our test, and we want to say, Well, we can enhance our existing test. Let's just write a new test. We could have enhanced an existing test. We can say um, you know, first name label not red when not empty. I'm not really saying what color it should be. I'm just saying it's not red. So I'm going to say form dot first name text get fake result 
So it's not empty. To say that, you know, that should have triggered, whenever the, the text is changed, it should fire the first name text changed event. And then we're going to say assert that is true, that on the form, first name label color set was called. And it shouldn't have been read. Okay, that's my test. Build. Run my tests. My test is read. Let's go and make it pass. Go back over here to my mediator. And I'll say, yeah, you know what? Let's just say, We'll add a getter on the interface, add a member to remember this original color, whatever it was. We're not saying what the color should be. We're just saying whatever it is originally Okay, now I have to go back over here to my production form and implement the new getter. So down here, I didn't have a getter before. Now I need one. I'm not going to take that. I'm just going to say return first name label dot four color. And I need to put that on my fake. build. My build succeeded. Go back over here to my test. My test is green. <laughs> that was pretty cool. Uh, I, I didn't think I could get it done in three minutes, but. Well, we had actually that three minutes I had to find them on that. Um, yeah, I did a similar uh, version of this presentation to .NET user group meeting, and I was going to submit um, the, the more elaborate behavior plus test version to their site. So um, I guess, John, we can put a link to that on the wiki when I have it uploaded on their site. Yeah, we can do that. Or we can upload another copy on your site, too. Yeah, the link would be perfect. That way, there will be, no, be no duplication. Yeah, it might take them a while to get it up on their site, but we'll okay. see. Whichever is faster, we'll get it to you. What, what are those so, sites? Sorry, what? What are those sites? What, what are uh, the .NET user group meeting has a, .NET user group has a site. You just Google network. for that. Um, I don't know. Yeah, what, yours is on your on your handout. Um, we've got a handout that we'll get you, and you'll have to copy the URL because I did not make enough copies. Got it, or if it was obvious, or what? Yes. So, <clears throat> I was just wondering, what, is, is there a point where it's, it's where you wouldn't want to use unit tests in place of something like using UIA, the user interface automation, the new stuff about the framework, where it takes advantage of the accessibility interface, and, and, and you probably much much faster, much easier, go in and detect um, states of the buttons and, te and the text box and things like that. Yeah. But it doesn't have all stuff for colors, it's, so you lose there, yeah. but. The hidden subtext under your question is, does Microsoft really understand unit testing? And I have to come to the conclusion, not really. Well, I, but the, the reason that I say that is because the, I, I believe the framework you're talking about works through like event recording and event playback. And the, you can make tests that way. The problem is as soon as you go and change your UI, all the tests break. And they break for stupid reasons, like you moved a control from the left to the right. And now the mouse click at that XY position is in oh, the wrong place. Well, I don't think it deals with the XY location of the button as much as just 
the physical button itself. So if the name of the button changes, it breaks, but not so much if the location changes. Okay, but that's but that's another good example of a fragile test, right? Why well, should my test unit break test if I, would, would change what but if I but see if I rename using a renaming tool, it's gonna rename all the names in my in my tests too. I mean I could go right in here with ReSharper and do rename on one of those things, like members of the interface, and it would rename it in my production code and in all my tests, and it would just recompile and still work. Whereas if I, um, I mean, if I, in this code, if I go into the forms designer and I change the name of a control, as long as the name of the control, the rename gets reflected in that event handler and in the implementation of the interface, nothing else needs to care that my control name changed. Um, I mean, I'm not intimately I, I, familiar I, with that framework, but I, my understanding I, that it's kind of a bit of playback. There's, a, there's something on CodeFlex that has a whole uh, testing suite kind of built around it, but I think you can build the test suite right in, right in uh, as a separate project, so you might be able to take, take advantage of those renames as well. Yeah, I'd have, to, I'd have to look more closely at that one, but generally, event, every, whenever it says, yeah, I can even test GUI stuff by doing event recording and event playback. I've seen that, I've seen people go down that path many, many times. On the other end of the forest, they come out battered and bloody and bruised. <laughs> they never come out waving a flag going, yeah! They all go, that sucked. I never want to do that again. And that's how they get to the conclusion, you can't unit test GUI. Okay. So, as far as that specific framework goes, I'd have to look more closely into it, but I would not recommend trying to do unit testing GUI by doing event recording and event playback, unless the GUI is stable, like it's, you know, we're just trying to get regression tests on this code and we're not going to change this GUI and it's been the same for five years, then it's okay, because you're not changing it. But as soon as you change it, all the event playback stuff breaks. Any other, any other questions? Okay. All right, so we've had a chance. We've had a chance to code uh, at each one of your table. You know the person who was getting done fastest. So that is your driver. So look at your table. Look at the guy that was getting done fastest at your table. Make him the driver. All right? And then I don't care who the other roles are. You've got, make sure you pick up those roles. All right? The learning's going to come from the conversation that you have between Hot Rod Hundley and the arm, okay, the old man and the arm. That's where your learning's going to come. We're about to do a little project, and I want it to go fast. So that's why I want the, the fastest coder at your table to take it. So pick him. Who's your fastest coder? Point to him. That table's only got two. There's gonna, somebody needs to go help that. Somebody needs to go be, help that table. That's, well, they did with a pearl guy over there left. Um, so uh, we need at least four. There's, there's two, four. We can send one more person back there to, to commentate with them, and that'll be good. So fastest programmer at this table? Who, who do we pick? Okay, perfect. Who's doing this one here? Okay, excellent. And then we're going to have... Doug, if you want to be... If you want to be the, the baby, <laughs> that would be perfect. All right, so the exercise that we're going to do, again, a very simple one. We want a password validator. Now, what a password validator in my goofy world means we accept a string and return, return the input string if it is a valid password. Otherwise, return null. Okay? All right, so what I want to hear is, I want to hear, I want to see the typing, I want to see the pair, and then I want to see somebody standing behind them talking to each other. Okay, get up behind them and talk. Yeah, and talk. And don't forget we're doing this test first. So the commentator just starts, got to start talking. Who's the commentator? Okay, so that makes you two the question tater, yeah. So just talk, talk, talk. I listen to those questions. Yeah, play by play, answer their questions, try to maybe poke them, maybe they can be the color commentating occasionally, you know how Hot Rod does it. He ignores Booner pretty much. Okay, that's all the time you got. We're shipping. Hands, hands off the computer, we're shipping what we've got.
<laughs> yeah, well, this is arbitrary standard. So, so yeah, with QA, we don't have one of those. We just laid them off. If we don't get this release out right now, we are companies going out of business, and you guys will be working for free. All right, so what are we shipping? Table, table number one, what are we shipping? <laughs> Do we, is it even working right now? Okay, so what have you got? All right, perfect. That's good. I like that. Table, you guys? The first one. So we're going to ship. Okay. How about you guys? Does it, does it compile? So it doesn't compile at all. So it throws an exception. Is it going to crash when they try to when they try to do the username and password or not? We won't crash. That's good. That at least we won't get that. <laughs> okay, everybody. Okay, so we can actually ship that. Um, eight characters. We got eight characters. How about you guys? Stop coding. Hands off the keyboard. Take it away. Thank you. All right. So. All right, so I've got. I know. <laughs> All right, so that was our first. That was our first release. Um, now that you've got it out to customers, we are going to do the next one. Um, a password recommender. So what a password recommender is going to be? Am I going the right way? Okay, so if the password is invalid, return a suggestion. And you got. And you've got five minutes. Go. Forever. It says, yeah, if you send it bad data, it's going to fail. But, but it's trapped. So the, so the, okay. Let me, let me answer that a little bit later because I want to stop this right now. Okay, time. That's it. Your time's up. All right. Hands off the keyboard over in that corner. Okay, so. We didn't quite get the exercise, the refactoring exercise that I wanted to get to, but we got the, what I wanted to show you there is how many times did we have working code, broken code, working code. Is your code working right now? No, it's not. If you hit Control Z like three times, would it be working? Yeah, see that? That? How about you guys? Is it working right now? Okay, all right. <laughs> Okay, how about that? Well, I, I, okay, tell me what it, tell me, it compiles. Okay, last time we had it, last time it didn't it let anybody through. Okay, all right, how about this, this team? It compiles, okay. And your team? The what? It'll work, okay. All right, so we had two tables, we had two tables that actually were within three control Z's to working, back to working, okay? We could have actually shipped that. We had a couple of tables that really were going out of business. Actually, we had three tables that were going out of business with, and two that we actually stay in business with, all right? This is part of why I do test driven development. My code works within three or four undos, okay? Something can ship. And something's going to ship without bugs. They, uh, you don't need a long extended QA cycle. If you attended Kay's session, she told my story. And a year, we ended up spent, we locked the code down for two weeks. And in that two weeks, we did, what did we do in that two weeks? Testing and performance. Testing and performance. Thing. In the two weeks before we released. The bugs just were fixed as we went. We could have released three months earlier. I mean, the reason we landed on the date we said we would, because we could have gone three months earlier and just cut features. We delivered features. We delivered working features, and we were within three control Z's. And if we're using source control, we just pull the stack off the top and could hand it to them. And that's going to work. It's not going to have bugs in it. It might not have all the features. It might have a half implemented feature, but it's not going to have bugs. So two teams, two teams survived out of, and, and three teams, or well, the company's gone out of business. All right, finally, I've got, get through these. 
All right, who knows who this guy is? Nope. Nope. That guy is, you know who that guy is. Who's been to Wikipedia? Yeah, everybody. That guy's Ward Cunningham. He invented the wiki. Fitness, he invented. Pair programming, he invented. All right. I tell you, I have to tell you, I have to tell you about that guy because he does not publish enough for himself. He's not busy out promoting himself. He's the guy that you sit down and talk to if you ever get a chance. And he's brilliant. You know who this guy is. Somebody tell me. That's Kent Beck. He's the one that coined test driven development. He's the one that wrote it up. Him and Ward Cunningham paired together. All right. The reason I put this guy up there, this is Michael Feathers. He wrote legacy code. He really, he really can. If you read the legacy code book, some of the stuff Richard showed you how to do, if you've got legacy code, get his book, learn those patterns. Because if you want to do test driven development, you need to turn your legacy code into tested code. And he tells you how to. Working effectively with legacy code is the name of the book. All right. And you guys know who that is? That is Bob Martin, 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 Uncle Bob Martin. Um, he's the one that we did the first kata. He did that kata, the prime factors, and solid clean code. He's got the book Clean Code. He's got the solid principles. He's worth reading. All right. I've got one more thing. So the name of this thing was Try Test Driven Development. And you, in this class, in a really short amount of time, you've gone through multiple cycles of this. All right? My goal for you is when you leave here, you try test driven development again and again and again. And you can do it. All right? You've seen it. I've shown you. I've shown you. I mean, Rich, what Richard, what Richard showed you is some of the tough stuff. What... You know, what, when we went through the rhythm, it's, some of it's easy and some of it's harder. There are some things you need to learn. That's on the sheet of paper if we got those out. There's not enough copies. There is not enough copies for everybody. So you're going to have to fight over them. And at the bottom, I'm giving one per table. At the bottom of... At the bottom of the is a URL, and that's been updated since I printed this copy out. So for C sharp, it's more current. So you need to go to the URL anyway. So I would write it down. How many of you guys have to work with C sharp plus code? I am. Yep. Yeah. So uh, I got more copies. Okay. The one got another one. The the thing you want is really the URL on the bottom. You've been an absolutely fantastic class. Uh, it's and I've got one more. Um, it was really fun. I've never, I have not given Richard that three minutes, so I really appreciate Richard doing that thing. And we, and as much pressure as we put on Jeff during his code, that was really cool. And then your experience. I mean, it was, it was amazing. I did this for the C Sharp user group, and it just like was. It took an hour to get through that, that first exercise. We managed to cut this one way down. So you guys were awesome. All right, good luck. Thank you, guys.